Hello. Welcome back to the Space School Log. We're continuing our Earth series with part four. Before we begin, special thanks to our patrons, voice actors, everyone else part of my team. If you want to get Pride of the Empire merch, it is available until season one of the Earth series comes to an end. Otherwise, our story continues shortly after the defeat of the rebellion over Scarif. The battle saw the end of everyone that aided the rebels and their fight against the Empire, and now the galaxy seemed united. The TIE Defender was one of the prided constructions of the Copernican system, and Grand Admiral Thrawn, responsible for the defeat of the rebels at Scarif, was enthralled with his project's success. While the test of the first reactor blast of the Death Star at Scarif was an overwhelming victory, there was absolutely no reason for the Empire to use the Death Star. The rebellion was squashed, there was no resistance in the galaxy anymore. The people of Earth felt that their faith in the Empire was rightly placed, and so they were rewarded for their hard work in helping maintain peace in the galaxy. While the Emperor was rather disappointed in Thrawn for going behind his back, he was thrilled with the fact that the rebellion was squashed, and more than anything, the TIE Defender project played a real part in that process. The Emperor would go on a galaxy-wide tour, a victory tour if you will, as a boost for morale of the star systems under the control of the Empire. While yes, there are plenty of provinces that didn't belong to Imperial territory, this victory tour was intended to bolster inspiration for more recruits to join the Empire. While the Rebels hadn't become a galaxy-wide threat at their highest peak, they did have people, especially in the Mid-Rim, on edge that they might be attacked. It's why the Copernican system supplied Grand Admiral Thrawn with the TIE Defender project. The Emperor traveled around the galaxy, and the morale of the United Empire was higher than ever before. There was no reason to doubt the success that they had, and yet, there was still more they could do. The Emperor made a note to the loyal systems of the Empire that there would be a tournament of sorts. The most loyal worlds in the galaxy would have their pickings of an outer rim world that they wanted to colonize. Essentially meaning that a system backed by the Empire could conquer an outer rim world and take it over, use its resources, and make it better. This was actually brilliant on part of the Emperor. It meant that systems would pay their own credits, supply their own military, and take over the scum ridden worlds across the outer rim without making the Empire have to pay for it. This meant the greater Empire didn't have to employ its resources to go into the outer rim and deal with the last of the pirates. While yes, the greatest threat in the outer rim was destroyed nearly a decade before, in Crimson Dawn, the Empire still had no grip in the Outer Rim. Now Palpatine made an effort to tell the systems in this competition that they could not compete with each other. They could not take another planet from each other, and they were to work together. There were no rivalries, no matter how friendly or hostile they got. Palpatine was very incredibly sure to make sure everyone was aware of that. The point of this operation was to get rid of the scum in the Outer Rim, and so the competition began. And while all the core worlds were vying for the best Imperial Admirals to lead the operation, the Copernican system was the one to get a hold of Grand Admiral Thrawn. He enjoyed the idea of this little sport, and of course he was going to support the planet that helped him secure the greatest advantage during the Rebel Incursion. The Rebellion's war effort wasn't referred to as a galactic civil war, rather it was just referred to as the Great Rebel Incursion. Regardless, the Chimera and her fleet were deployed into the Outer Rim, and within a manner of hours, Hours, the planet of Tatooine would be captured by Thrawn and his forces. He would send Death Troopers down to the surface and have Jabba the Hutt and his band of minions executed. The bounty hunters were given the option to serve the Empire or die. And so, many of them surrendered themselves over to the Empire. The focus of the Copernican system would turn Tatooine into the Canto Bight of the Outer Rim. While Canto Bight surely was out there as a star system, the Copernican system saw value in Tatooine, especially with the opportunity to build up a gambling industry on the planet. While yes, gambling was bad, and that was very obvious, it was a great way for the people of Earth to generate more income for their system. Though the first and most important step in this process was clearing up Tatooine. The planet was a dust bowl, and between the greedy little gremlins called Jawas and the ever so desolate people of the sand, Tatooine was wasn't exactly the most exciting place in the galaxy to travel to. Considering the academy at Zen Zhao was full of excited individuals to jump to the front lines, the Copernican system would firstly send a group of newly graduated stormtroopers to the sands of Tatooine. 
While officials who now ran the planet never visited, they took a large bit of their budget and began directing it towards Tatooine. Scientists from the Copernican system were also present, because they believed there should be a natural water source on the planet, and so, the scientists were trying to figure out how the water would be able to stay on Tatooine under the two suns and all the heat that accumulated under them, as well as how cold it tended to get at nighttime. The scientists spent several months doing this, while at the same time, all three of the largest districts, Mos Espa, Mos Eisley, and Anchorhead, were receiving new buildings. This was incredible for the people of Tatooine. Their cities began to stick out of the desert incredibly. Of course, the people of Earth knew how to build terrific cities on Tatooine. They had built them all across the Arabian Peninsula. Once the three largest cities were built up with skyscrapers that from the ground looked as if they could touch the two suns, a new economic system was put in place. The Copernican system expected flak from the people of Tatooine, which is why stormtroopers were present, but the only flak they got back was from the Jawas who were arrested in massive droves because of their tendency to pirate materials away from others and sell them at a higher price. They were greedy little buggers and so the Empire dealt with them. The Tuscans on the other hand were left alone. Moisture farming as a whole began to disappear off the planet, the economy of Tatooine began to evolve to fit in on a galactic level. Of course, one would assume that the people would dislike the change, but the change was actually good. Tatooine was finally getting the attention it needed for over a millennia. The planet was left out to dry during the era of the Republic, and now they finally had someone paying for what they needed and couldn't collectively afford themselves. Especially without the scourge of the huts, the people of Tatooine were able to thrive and expand. The vast cities became icons on the Outer Rim. Something about the Copernican system was highly evident. Their thousands of years of grinding to catch up to the rest of the galaxy made them the perfect outlet for creating solid growth in a planet that struggled to find itself as a place of refuge in the galaxy. Within a year and a half, the cities would tower above the sands, and within the span of three years, Tatooine would have the first ocean in a thousand years. Originally, Tatooine was a water world, much like Kamino, but after thousands of years, it became a desolate sand dune. The ocean would sit nicely between the cities, and it would be an outlet of a tropical haven for wary travelers from across the galaxy. The core worlds who took over the other planets in the Outer Rim began to struggle. They didn't really have the resources to successfully build up on those planets, so the planet struggled under Imperial occupation. Other planets from the Outer Rim began to heavily migrate to Tatooine because at this point it was still affordable to the average individual and the average family in the Outer Rim. The people of Earth ensured that others in the Outer Rim would have the distinct possibility to travel to Tatooine with a discounted price. This was also an ingenious idea because it drew people away from other planets in the Outer Rim and it also meant that Tatooine would become the focal point of resurgence in the Outer Rim. Originally, the plan was to turn Tatooine into a gambling hub inspired by the success of Cantobite, but what ended up happening instead was the growth in the economic sector, and also the very popular pod racing which became more of a professional league with the Empire supporting it, mostly the Copernican system. Credits were credits, and what would the Empire say? Not like they would just say no to more credits. They made pod racing a galaxy-wide league with a pro league and an amateur league. The Copernican system took a hold of this and ran with it, making everything of this league a little more professional and a lot more serious, especially without the involvement of the huts or pirates. Average people had the opportunity to succeed. Though with the success of pod racing, most Espa became a gambling capital on the Outer Rim. Massive casinos were placed all across the city, and people relished in the growth. Of course, as gambling does, there were downsides, but the truth is, the house always wins, and the house in this situation was not just the Copernican system, but the Empire. Regardless, the Empire itself was looking stronger than ever. While there were cases of rebellion all across the galaxy in certain circumstances, the site was very rare, and every time it appeared, it was immediately squandered. The Empire was very militaristically strong, and that was ever so apparent, though there were issues issues arising in the core, especially on the planet of Coruscant, though none of these issues were brought to light. One of the issues was the Emperor using the Force to transfer his essence into another body. The public wouldn't notice anything different. Palpatine had a tendency to show himself off through hologram, and the hologram resembled the face of a man who hadn't been damaged badly. While he told the entire galaxy he was badly scarred by the Jedi, he was rarely ever seen in person. He appeared before the Senate, 
while the Senate was still existent, though he always wore a robe that covered his head, so the essence transfer wouldn't really change anything from the public perspective of him, though for those closest to him this would create an issue, especially with the second in command, his agent of chaos, Lord Vader. While the Jedi had been wiped out almost entirely, Vader had an issue with his master using the force to get himself a new body without ever showing him how to escape the living hell he existed in. Vader would challenge his master in a duel, and during the duel of which Palpatine was winning, he would deploy his frightening new student, Mara Jade, onto Vader, and Sidious and his student would kill Vader. It was a tragic conclusion to the travesty of a life that Skywalker, or Vader, had to live. But it didn't matter to Sidious. He now had his student in Mara Jade. She was a fiery young individual, and she was trained by Sidious essentially from birth. She would bring in a new era of the Empire, at least in her master's eyes. Mara had every reason to be loyal. She hadn't had any inclination to fear her master or what he would do to her. That lasted very well until shortly after the death of Vader, and when she was tasked with killing the remaining members of the Inquisitorius. It wasn't the fact that she had to kill people who used the Force. For Mara, it was more the fact that she had to kill people who spent nearly two decades serving the Emperor and the Empire, especially the Grand Inquisitor, who was never killed by the rebels on the Thal. Though, Mara was secretly okay with it. See, Mara J never got outside of her training grounds. She never saw much of the Empire or the leadership role her master played. While she was a Sith and that was the simple truth, she had an issue with her master. This didn't happen overnight, but it did take several years. Just about 20 years after the Battle of Scarif, otherwise known as ABS, she decided she had enough. The previous 20 years were terrific for the Greater Empire. Any sign of rebellion was crushed and Mara was known throughout the ranks of the Empire. She had her favorites in the ranks of the Empire and she built a following of loyal Imperial officers. It originally was simply innocent following, but as the years began to pass by and the need to ascend the Imperial ranks headed to the forefront of their minds, she slowly began to resent her master, as did the officers that followed her. Palpatine had 40 years as an Emperor of the Galaxy, 50 years as leader of the Republic and of the Empire. Mara Jade believed that his reign deserved to come to an end, especially because she believed that the throne belonged to her. She saw error with some of Palpatine's habits. For example, Mara didn't agree with the enslavement of the Wookiees and the other outcast civilizations across the galaxy. While this may have been common knowledge to high-ranking Imperial officials like Mara Jade, this wasn't common knowledge for most of the systems across the Empire. Only high-ranking Imperial officers knew of this. Most common folk never heard of it. Speaking of high-ranking Imperial officers, Grand Moff Tarkin had passed away of a natural death, and the galaxy was remembering him for the hero he was not just during the Clone Wars, but for his dedication to the Empire and serving it for the entire duration of his life. Tarkin was one of the last remaining individuals who had served both the Empire and the Republic to die in servitude to the Empire. During this day of remembrance across the galaxy, rebellion would arise, though it wouldn't be in the same form as it was with the rebel incursion of Zero ABS. It would come strictly from within the ranks of the Empire. Mara Jade spent the latter part of 20 ABS to gather up a garrison of Imperials who believed they could take over the Empire and run it better than the established government. Most of these officers had resentment for individuals like Grand Admiral Thrawn and Moff Gideon who had favorability with the Emperor. It was an ego battle, and because they were losing, they could only result to violence. It was in their nature. Inferior individuals always turn to violence when the odds are against them, especially in the mental realm. This was the same here. And so, when Mara believed her legions were ready, she poisoned Grand Moff Tarkin knowing that the galaxy would remember him for his service, and then she would strike. Mara Jade's forces would steal the only mega-class Star Dreadnought in the Imperial fleet. It was built at the Saturn Drive Yards, but it was currently stationed over Molinist for testing purposes. The entire support fleet was a collection of Jade Loyalists. Most of the galaxy wouldn't know about this incursion, though it would be heavily evident in the core that Rebellion had returned. Though this wasn't any regular rebellion, this was a ready force that could overthrow the central government of the Empire, and at the moment it seemed like it was making headway through Anaxis. One may ask why they didn't start with Coruscant, the answer is simple. 
course, that was too highly defended. The Jade Loyalists would likely be able to draw the main fleet out of Coruscant, and then they can march on it and take the capital out from Palpatine. When the messages reached Coruscant, Palpatine was outraged. He honestly couldn't believe the fact that Mara would betray him like this, but he figured he could put another rambunctious student in their place, and so called together a council of the best minds in the Empire, at the very least, those who hadn't betrayed the Empire. Emperor Palpatine informed them that their security should be placed at the highest regard and ensure that they deal with these insurgents as fast as they can. Palpatine wasn't playing around, and so Thrawn was placed at the top of Imperial Command to deal with these insurgents. Thrawn and the Chimera were stationed above Coruscant, and he strategically laid out plans for a galaxy-wide conflict. He practiced on this map this large for pure enjoyment of the hunt. It was a strategy game in his own mind. And as of now, the Empire didn't know how large Mars loyalists were. It could be multiple fleets, or it could just be one fleet with a really, really big ship. All he knew is that the superstar Jedi in the Imperial fleet wouldn't be large enough to handle the firepower of the supremacy. Luckily, the Empire, per directive of Thrawn, was producing a new leg of Imperial war machines called the Resurgent Class Star Destroyer. These vessels were much larger than the traditional Star Destroyer, and they packed much more of a punch than the traditional Star Destroyer. Of course, the only issue is that a few of them were finished and they were only stationed over the Kuat Drive Yards and at the Saturn Drive Yards and Thrawn wasn't too sure if he just wanted to give them up or move the vessels around. Thrawn knew that if Coruscant wasn't the next target, then one of the Emperor's prized shipyards would become the next target for Mara Jade. Thrawn knew Mara personally, and while he knew she was bright, he wasn't exactly sure she was a tactical genius, even with the force she had surrounding her. Thrawn had much more experience under his belt, and in Thrawn's mind, experience outweighed everything. Regardless, it was a bigger issue than the mega-class Dark Dreadnought, and that was a fact that Imperial Rebels had tied offenders. This would be a true contest of superiority. Though the Emperor and the Military Council made a point of keeping this knowledge secret from the population of the greater galaxy. They didn't want anyone in fear of this rebellion, and they certainly didn't want systems rallying behind this rebellion. Palpatine was sure to keep the Jade Loyalists away from the public eye, and away from being able to send out a message to the rest of the galaxy. Mara wasn't focused on that, she was focused on taking over Coruscant and killing Palpatine, and her officers were too. There's a reason why these officers were intimidated by Thrawn and the other high-ranking Imperial officers who were completely calculated in all of their work. These officers were brutes and their brains were functional enough to turn on the engine of a pod racer, and that was the best case scenario for most of them. After the defeat of the Empire at Anaxas, the Jade Loyalists would move their fleet into deep space and completely confuse the Empire. The Imperial forces would continue to stay stationed at their current locations, while Imperial High Command at the Kuat Drive Yards and the Saturn Drive Yards were encouraged to focus their construction on the resurgent class Star Destroyers and mass produce them as fast as they could, fill them up with fully armed crews and await further orders from the High Council. They understood their orders and got straight to work. There wouldn't be any hint of activity from the Jade Loyalists for three weeks. While the people of Anaxis picked up the pieces quietly, without anyone across the Empire knowing it due to no news coverage, no travel, or no individuals going in or out of the planet, Anaxis went dark, and no one questioned it. Because at the Space Yards, they were informed that Anaxis was dealing with a nebulous storm that caused all their electricity and circuitry to dysfunction, which meant that ships couldn't travel to Anaxis without being in danger to others or themselves. This obviously wasn't true, but it was enough for the public to believe it to be true. After three weeks, the Jade Loyalists would arrive at a hyperspace outside of the Copernican system. The people of Imperial High Command sent out a distress signal with the word help, before communications leaving the Copernican system were shut down. The entire planet went into high alert, and the shield gate over Earth was opened up, locking down the entire planet, not allowing travel in or out. Imperial High Command directed the AI from the moon base to ready themselves, while at the same time bringing the six resurgent class Star Destroyers to the back lines to defend the shield gate, while the several Golan platforms defended Earth from the supremacy. 
Once the Supremacy and her support fleet got into combat with the security of the Imperial Earth, they met stiff resistance. The Copernican system was prepared for any incursion, and while the people of Earth may have been unaware, they were well aware now. Thrawn deployed the Third Fleet from Kuat towards the Copernican system, as well as dispatching his own fleet with the Chimera and two Super Star Dreadnoughts to the Copernican system as well. This left the ancient pride of the core to defend Coruscant, as Thrawn moved back the fleet from Corellia and the fleet from Cato Nemodia to return to Coruscant and defend the planet in his absence. This was a ticking time bomb for the Jade Loyalists. They needed to crack through the Copernican system defenses before Thrawn arrived. Mara chose the Copernican system because, as she knew, the planet was well defended, but she believed it would be a crippling blow to the Empire, especially because it would take longer for the core support fleet to arrive out than it would for a fleet to arrive if they had attacked Kuat instead. This battle wasn't an overwhelming success initially. The Star Destroyers that were stationed to protect the Supremacy were no match for the Resurgent class Star Destroyers, but once the Supremacy and her weapons came into range, it ripped through the Star Destroyers defending Earth. The Golan platforms were no use against the heavy, long-range cannons of the Supremacy, and so Mara was able to park her ship out of range and fire the long-range weaponry at the Star Destroyers. It really was cheating, but she didn't care. It forced the defense fleet to head into close combat with the Supremacy. The AI fighter fleet was also ripped to shreds thanks to the numerous squads of TIE defenders that Mara's fleet possessed. On the other hand, the TIE defenders defending Earth weren't piloted by experienced pilots. The only pilots on the planet were the best at the Imperial Flight Academy and Zen Zhao. While they were the best on this side of the galaxy, they were no match for weathered pilots who had been putting down insurgencies and civilizations for decades. The Battle of Earth was heavy. To the people on the ground, they noticed that the vessel constructed at the Saturn Drive Yards was being used against them. The supremacy was massive, even considering its distance from Earth. It was very visible from the ground with the naked eye, even during daylight. The people of Zen Zhao were terrified, but the leaders of the Council of Earth informed the people that there was no reason to fret. Emperor Palpatine was sending his best troops to protect him from this insurgency. The battle raged on though. It was more of a siege than anything, but the defenses of the Copernican system made it more of a battle. The battle itself raged on for hours, giving time for the hypervelocity cannon stationed on the moon to be able to tilt around into view of the supremacy of which Mara Jade would order her support ships in the way, but not soon enough. The hypervelocity cannon would rip through the port side cannon compartment of the vessel. Mara would panic. This meant that there was almost no plausible escape for her. She looked over her support ships. There was one Star Destroyer remaining, and so she ran from the bridge of the Supremacy. While the Supremacy was laying down the heat and just about to break, the hypervelocity cannon changed the game. Mara and her overly confident officers believed Earth systems would be easy to penetrate, and that was far from the truth. The Copernican system had a lot of top secret bases and defenses that were only known to Thrawn and the Emperor, mostly because they were approved by Thrawn and the Emperor to be built. Of course, it was customary for systems, especially loyal to the Emperor, to ask for permission to do something. It wasn't really required. Mara was never really aware of these, and while there was a lot of debris left over Earth, it would be salvaged and reused in the construction of new vessels. Shortly after the first strike of the hypervelocity cannon, Grand Admiral Thrawn would arrive out of hyperspace in his flagship and the rest of the vessels, and they would blindside a weakened supremacy. Because Mara fled the supremacy, there were chances to rid the ship of its crew and continue to use the massive Star Destroyer. Within a matter of hours, the insurgency would be destroyed, and the supremacy would survive a rough encounter with Earth's defense system. While victory was terrific to the people of Earth, there was something rather unnerving about this. People began to question what an empire was hiding from them. Being that there was a second rebellion this large in 20 years that had enough of an impact to draw in the attention of the Copernican system, was it possible that the empire was wrong? All of the Jade Loyalist survivors of the Battle of Earth would be executed for betraying the Empire, and those who served valiantly would be given promotions. Many people on the Copernican system began to consider if there were actual issues with the Empire, and while they would continue to get support and financial stability from the Saturn Drive Yards and continuously growing the economy on Tatooine, the lavish lifestyle would continue. Though these questions were reasonably drawn, their faith in their Emperor would be tested as a rising darkness began began to cross the far side of the galaxy, something so unnatural it upset the balance of everything in the galaxy. 
even the force. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is part four of six. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Jonathan Pimp Daddy Bane, Darth Cheesy Apollo, Mad Men and Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, and Flynn Van Cease for supporting the channel. Hit 2,000 likes on this video. I don't know what's coming next, but it is. If you want to see a what if, let me know below. I read all your comments, but I'm doing crossovers. Check out the Twitch, community Discord, or Patreon if you want to support me in other ways. Otherwise, if you want some Earth merch, Pride of the Empire merch is down below. If you want to get it, limited time merch during the Earth series. Uh, the Broken One is also limited time merch. Otherwise, let's talk about our story. Um, so, you didn't see this coming, did you? You all thought I was going to do the Yu Zhang Vong, and that didn't happen. I can't just make it easy for you guys. You guys know I'm not going to make it predictable. I, I'm surprised more of you didn't see this coming. Maybe not this, but you know. I gotta keep it predictable. There's two more episodes left, and I gotta keep you guys on your heels. On your feet? On your feet? Yeah, on your feet, whatever. I gotta keep you guys... You know, I gotta keep you guys' attention, you know? Um, now, I, I obviously don't believe this is a filler episode. I believe this episode is actually very, very important to the story itself, the larger story itself and um i believe the larger story itself will be very enjoyable especially when i combine it all into what like a two hour and 30 minute long movie um but no um this 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 particular episode isn't meant to be a filler episode so i really hope that isn't what you got from this this episode was really meant to actually be the fourth part um i originally like i had originally come up with extra ideas which is why i put it in a poll on the main uh community page for you guys and i didn't really expect you guys to say oh yeah we want four five and six and i was like well i guess i'll do four five and six i had the ideas i just didn't expect you guys to be like yeah let's do it um so i was super hyped when i found out you guys were actually really into seeing these these next parts um but like you know to me uh th this is a very crucial step in the next the next two parts of the story so I wanted to leave you guys on edge. You guys don't know what's coming next. I know what's coming next. I am so excited. This this series is a lot of fun. And I, I, I know I've been alluding to season one. And, um, you know, if you guys if you guys continue to do it like this, I might do a season two of this. Um, but we'll get there when we get there. Otherwise, I love you all. Spread the love. And always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you. <laughs> <laughs>